What's up? This is Dr. Taylor Crick at the Washington Wellness Center, and today's video is about bloating. Bloating is so incredibly common. I would say it's one of the top three uh, things that bring people into our office. Um, I, I would guess fatigue, anxiety, and bloating are probably the top three. And bloating, out of all the three of those, when I hear bloating, I'm like, oh, this is going to be tricky. Um, and so for such a simple symptom, it is really tricky. So the purpose of this video today is to go through a little bit of everything with bloating. And I think that the, the, the point that you're going to get from this is that it's really, really complicated. Even though it's just, it's just bloating, it's really, really complicated and can be a really, really tricky puzzle. So I want to explain some of the things that you can look for, some of the diets that are out there, some of the supplements that people take, some of the things that, that could really, really help you. But I also think that after watching this video, hopefully it gives you some ideas and some resources, but I think that it also will encourage you to work with somebody because it's hard to put the pieces of this puzzle together. So first off, you know, why is it common in a functional medicine office? Well, because what that's not supposed to happen. What is the conventional model? It's this, right? Um, and, and you can see what we have there, uh, uh, probably some omeprazole, some acid reducer, some over-the-counter, some milk of magnesia, some Pepto-Bismol, some, some Beano, some gas relief, some sodium bicarbonate baking soda, you know, just random stuff there for bloating. And when you understand the mechanism, you know, that's really the goal of, of everything that we do with our practice and with this YouTube channel and just in general functional medicine is when you understand the mechanism, you understand how these things can make it worse. And what they're finding now is, is that many of these acid blockers, these PPI proton pump inhibitors, and even some of the over-the-counter stuff, they lead to a much bigger problems down the road, um, including cancer. Um, with some of them. So very, very uh, concerning, but obviously people are looking for a solution. I've, I've had bloating patients that they didn't use the S word, but they implied uh, that they, they could end their lives, right? And, and I wasn't concerned enough to report it, but they just kind of said, hey, this is miserable. If I have to keep living with this, I don't know if I can keep doing this. So I really need your help. And, and you know, they're they had great results. Um, but yeah, so people are looking for a solution. It is a miserable thing. Many bloating patients, they are bloated all day long. And so when we talk about trigger foods, they can't tell because they're just always bloated. Some patients will say, gosh, I love my morning belly. I hate my afternoon or evening belly. Or they'll say, gosh, I look pregnant. I've had a couple of kids and maybe my, my stomach isn't what it used to be. And gosh, I look pregnant. When the air builds up in there, I look pregnant. And some people can actually measure, like, boy, you're actually physically larger when you're bloated or distended. Now, that's a, a, a complicated thing about this is that in the bloating research world, it's interesting, I, I didn't know this, there is a, an actual difference between bloating and distension and meaning like, can we measure that you've actually expanded in size or is there the perception of bloating? And that's really, really interesting because a lot of people, they feel bloated, but there's not a, any actual change in size. Like if you blow up a balloon and it changes in size, you know, that makes sense. But some people, they just feel the perception of bloating. And so, you know, there are interesting things just in the patient history that are why this can be very, very complicated. And other digestive things are, are going to be present. So is there constipation? Is there diarrhea? Is there IBS or IBD? Is there SIBO? That's something we're going to talk about a lot. Is there autoimmunity? All these things can cause or contribute to bloating. Is there dysbiosis? Yes, every single time there's dysbiosis, but what caused the dysbiosis? Not to mention other symptoms that make up the clinical picture of, of a patient. Do they have fatigue? Do they have brain fog? Do they have joint pain? Do, what, what's their history? All those things really, really matter. So there are no two bloating uh, people the same. Um, and so it, it actually can be really, really complicated. So 
In order to understand bloating, I'm not going to do a full anatomy and physiology lesson, but in order to understand bloating, we need to have a background of the digestive tract and just a refresher of the digestive tract and how that works. Because once again, if you understand the mechanism, then you can understand some potential solutions or where they could help. So here's your GI tract. You know, you eat with your mouth. Of course, it's not on there. and It's really important though. That's when digestion begins, is with your eyes, your nose, then your, your teeth with chewing, your saliva begins breaking this down. We're going to get into that in a second, but food goes from the esophagus into the stomach, down in here, then all this little wobbly stuff down here is the small intestine. It's massive. It's just small, called small because it's small diameter, whereas the large intestine is larger diameter, but the small intestine is actually massive. I'll, I'll show some things about that in a second. Um, and then the large intestine goes up, over, down, and out, right? So that's your digestive tract. So, and, and, and what we're going to get into, this is going to be important because let's say we're going to talk about a concept called SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So let's say right here in the middle is where all this gas production is being, being made. Well, then it can't get out. You can't burp it out. It can't get out. You can't fart it out. It just feels like somebody blew up a balloon in your belly. So I think that this picture really illustrates wh where that's coming from. But then talking about how that works. So, you know, our digestive system is like an assembly line, right? But we call it the digestive de-assembly line because, you know, it, the assembly line concept makes sense as, you know, car passes by and one person puts on a wheel and one person puts on another wheel and one person puts on a steering wheel and the next person tightens all the bolts. And, you know, we all get that, get that, uh, metaphor there, but digestion, you're deassembling, right? You're taking a food, let's say it's a, a sandwich and you're deassembling that into vitamins, minerals, nutrients, calories and the rest is waste and we all know what that turns into and where that winds up and so that's the de-assembly line so let's go through this step by step and just talk about these things not in a ton of detail but it is really important that every step of this assembly line or de-assembly line is working properly it's like going back to the cars if somebody like who does the uh who tightens up the lug nuts is sick that day on the assembly line, the car is not going to work right. You know, that every single step of the assembly line is really, really important. And everybody has to do their job properly, or the whole thing is going to get jacked up. So that's the important thing here. So the digestive D assembly line. So first thing, your eyes and your nose, before you even get to your food, you're going to see it, you're going to smell it, and your brain too, you're gonna think about it. You know, if it's something that you really like, it's like, oh gosh, your mouth will start watering. So you see your food, you smell your food, your mouth literally starts watering and your salivary enzymes begin producing. Now those enzymes are made so that when you start chewing, then the enzymes can begin to break it down. Sometimes when people have bloating, they need to stop chewing gum because when they chew gum, they're producing digestive enzymes and they're running out of their digestive enzymes because they chew on gum all day and their body thinks that it's eating. Interesting. So the mouth, you chew your food down, really important that your food is broken down into smaller particles. That's this whole point of this whole process is to break your food down smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So chewing. The esophagus is the tube down here. It doesn't really do much. It's just kind of a travel tube, but that's where a lot of heartburn, a lot of reflux is. So I put on that it's closed off on, but with valves. So that's kind of important. The stomach is the next one. You have enzymes that, that are produced there, including hydrochloric acid, stomach acid. It's very acidic. A pepsin um, to break down foods, especially starting to break down proteins. So then your stomach is going to empty out into your small intestine, but along the way, you have these accessory organs. So the pancreas squeezes some enzymes into the tract so that it helps break food down further. The gallbladder releases bile that's filled with toxins from the liver, and the bile helps emulsify and break down fats. So you've got to have good pancreas function. You've got to have good gallbladder function. Hard to test those things, but through symptoms and through history, we can kind of get an idea of if those things are, are a problem. But it goes into your small intestine, um, and that's where a lot of absorption of nutrients, of vitamins and minerals begins to take place is in the small intestine. 
Then in the largest, large intestine, you have absorption of water, some things like B12, and it has the highest concentration of bacteria. So that's where most of your probiotics are. And that's an important concept when we talk about uh, small intestinal bacteria, that's where the bacteria aren't. Um, so we don't want them in the small intestine at the same concentrations that we have them at in the large intestine. Then we hit the rectum, the anus, and the toilet. So that is a very, very quick version of the digestive deassembly line. And the point is, like I said, with the gum, like I said, with the hydrochloric acid, the digestive enzymes, the gallbladder, all those are really, really important. And they could all be a factor in your bloating. Um, it's really hard to know. So I want to explain one common cause of bloating. And it's probably the most common cause of bloating. It's definitely the most common cause of bloating. But by explaining it, it helps explain this digestive deassembly line. Because when you understand how these uh, actions work in order, and you understand how they get jacked up, they can cause something called SIBO. Um, and, and that's very, very common with bloating is that we'll have SIBO. SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, okay? So if you have bloating, Google SIBO. There's tons and tons of info out there. Don't read too much into it because some of it's crap. Um, but SIBO is, is really relevant. And I'd say that like maybe 9 out of 10 of my bloating patients that come in say, have you heard of SIBO? And they say, no. And I'll ask them, you know, what have you been doing? And they'll say, I've been taking fiber supplements. I've been taking probiotics, I've been doing a plant-based protein with all these different things. And like all these things can make SIBO worse. So a lot of your typical gut information, like take fiber is a great example, can make SIBO worse. So it's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So bacteria that are supposed to grow in the large intestine translocate or move up into the digestive tract, into the small intestine. Now, when they're in there, they ferment certain foods, especially different fibers and sugars that we're going to talk about, but they ferment certain foods and they create gas, okay? And we know what fermentation is. We know what happens when we open a beer or a soda. Psst, you know, there's, there's gas production. There's been fermentation, uh, especially with the beer. Um, and so we know what that means. So when I explain this to people, they're like, Oh my gosh, that's exactly what it feels like. I eat broccoli and all of a sudden gas is produced. So it's in the small intestine. So like I said earlier, it's like these little bacteria in here are blowing up a balloon inside your gut and you can't burp it out. You can't fart it out. It's just kind of there and it sucks. So there is a SIBO breath test. We'll talk about it in a minute, but these bacteria are gonna produce two types of gases, hydrogen and methane. And one's gonna produce more diarrhea and one's gonna produce more constipation. And it's very possible that you have both or that you, your, your constipation and diarrhea don't match up perfectly. You could fluctuate back and forth from one to the other. I'll have some patients say like, gosh, it feels like the, the, the uh, dam is backed up and then the floodgates all open with their digestion. So motility is really important with this and the motility can affect SIBO and motility can be affected by SIBO. So you want to have good bowel motility and good proper bowel movements are, is really foundational. But over time, SIBO damages the small intestinal lining, creating inflammation, leaky gut, and malabsorption. So SIBO really, really important. So let's show you a picture of the, the gut lining and just look at that. So this is crazy too because in your small intestine, the square footage of your small intestine, there is so much surface area that if they laid it out, it has always been traditionally said that the small intestinal surface area was the equivalent of two tennis courts. Two tennis courts is how much surface area you have in your gut. Now, I've since heard that debunked that it's more like one tennis court, or you know, but it's it's an incredible, incredible, incredible surface area. So how is that possible? Well, so one right here is the small intestine, right? And we can all kind of picture that hose just like any other hose, and that makes sense. 
But in here, if we zoom in, there's these little folds. Okay, and each of these little folds is called a, a, a villi. Okay, so each of these folds is called a villi. And then each of these villi have what's on them called microvilli. So this is a villi. Then we're zooming in onto the villi here. So all these finger-like projections on here, that's how there's so much surface area. Then when we zoom in on one of those, each of these cells, we zoom in on that, it's got these little hairs on the end called microvilli. Those microvilli do all the absorption and things of your vitamins, minerals, and nutrients, and they're really important. So really, really, um, uh, just like a ton of surface area packed into there. Now, what SIBO can do, what celiac disease can do, what intestinal autoimmunity can do, what chronic inflammation can do, etc., is go in and basically like buzz cut these microvilli or blunt these microvilli. And if you see a biopsy slide of a celiac patient, you understand this pretty quickly because the celiac patient's microvilli will be completely destroyed and basically absent. So that's going to lead to leaky gut, malabsorption, all kinds of downstream problems. And that's just important that you understand that a little background on just how extensive this, uh, this network is in your small intestine. Um, and, and, and yeah, so when the bacteria grow in the small intestine, they create these gases. These gases are harmful. These gases damage these cells, lead to malabsorption, leaky gut, and other issues. So that's the concern. The bloating is just the symptom. The mechanism is the concern. So what can cause SIBO? Well, going back to the digestive deassembly line, what can cause dysbiosis or what can cause dysmotility? Well, a standard American diet. If you're eating a bunch of crap, it could lead to SIBO, absolutely, because you're just going to have dysbiosis. You have overgrowth of bad bacteria. You have undergrowth of good bacteria. You have intestinal permeability. You have intestinal inflammation. It's just, it can lead to food sensitivities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So standard American diet. Medications, certainly. Antibiotics that wipe out the good bacteria can definitely do it. Contraceptives are, are well known um, to, to do this. Um, so like that's the pill, you know, birth control. NSAIDs, so your Tylenols, your Aleves, your, um, your uh, ibuprofens, your, just, your anti-inflammatories, um, even uh, maybe, yeah, I think I misspoke there a little bit, but all your, anything over the counter like that, anything that people take regularly, Tylenol, ibuprofen, Aleve, Advil, all those things can mess it up. Proton pump inhibitors can mess it up big time. Now, NSAIDs, PPIs, contraceptives, and antibiotics do you think that those are used often or not often? They're used really stinking often, right? Like all the time. Like proton, proton pump inhibitors, I think, are the number one selling drug of all time, maybe. Um, NSAIDs, everybody uses them, pops them like candy, birth control for sure, antibiotics for sure. So most people have a history of one or more of these medications. Stress. Stress itself can cause this. Stress is going to lower the immune system function in the gut, making it more susceptible to overgrowth and, and uh, pathogen burdens and other things. So stress for sure. Stress is going to impact motility and, and all kinds of things with stress. Low stomach acid. Low stomach acid is incredibly common. So when you don't have enough stomach acid, we could do a whole video on stomach acid. It would probably be on reflux. But um, when you don't have enough stomach acid, the stomach acid neutralizes the bacteria in the small intestine. So when your stomach acid is low, it doesn't neutralize these overgrown bacteria. So you want adequate stomach acid. It's also the number one cause of reflux is low stomach acid, which sounds kind of backwards or paradoxical to what most people think if they're taking an antacid. Uh, but low stomach acid is a very common sign. And like I said, we could do a whole a whole video on low stomach acid, but the point of this one is to just go through each of these and show you like these are some of the things that need to be evaluated. So if somebody has, let's say somebody comes in and they have bloating, they're going to the bathroom twice a week, and they have reflux. That is a and they and they notice that like broccoli and cauliflower are problems for them. 
That is a bad combo, and it's going to be an uphill battle for that person. But we will be able to get their bloating under control. But they, we just have to realize that all these gears tie together, and we can't just fix like the downstream symptom of bloating without fixing all these gears. Or is it neurological? Uh, that's the slow motility, or do they have poor vagal tone that they're just not making enough bowel movements because their brain isn't telling their gut to poop often enough. So some of the things that we have to think through clinically for SIBO and for bloating, the same questions, whether it's SIBO or not, the same exact questions need to be looked at for bloating. I just think that SIBO is the best example of bloating. Not everybody has SIBO, but when you understand SIBO and if you act and you address it as if everybody had SIBO, those are kind of the solutions for every bloating case is look at these pieces of the puzzle along the digestive deassembly line. So what are some important labs if somebody has bloating? They all have question marks by them because once again, everybody's going to be different. Sometimes we're doing stool testing. Sometimes we're doing, I don't do SIBO breath tests. Sometimes we're doing intestinal autoimmunity. Sometimes we're doing urinary organic acid. So let's go through these. SIBO breath test. I don't do it because what it does is it tells us, yes, you have SIBO and it's producing hydrogen or methane. And it tells us a little bit of severity and it gives a baseline. And that's where some SIBO doctors would argue that, oh, you have to do the test. Uh, I, I just don't clinically agree. Um, I haven't found it to be that, that valuable when there's so many other things that we can look at. And when we're keeping somebody's budget in mind, we're looking more for root cause, not just to tell you what's going on. Um, so I don't think it's a very good root cause test, but it's popular and it's common and it's an option. Stool analysis certainly makes sense. Find out what's in there. Find out if there's a lot of, uh, if they're low on um, pancreatic enzymes or calprotectin or if there's inflammation or if there's um, a, a, an overgrowth or a parasite or um, an undergrowth or they're short on short chain fatty acids. Tons of information we can get from a stool analysis. Absolutely. Is there intestinal autoimmunity? Might not be the most relevant for bloating, depending on their history, but is there intestinal autoimmunity that's going to be way different? Is there, is, has SIBO induced intestinal, intestinal autoimmunity? Is there celiac? Is there um, a, a, a food sensitivity? That's the next one, I guess. Is there a food sensitivity? Um, are they reactive to certain foods and they've lost oral tolerance? Certainly relevant. Sometimes people pull out some food triggers and their bloating goes away. And we're going to talk about it in a second here, like how, how do you determine which diet or what you need to do? And it's, once again, I keep saying this, but it's really tricky. Um, organic acids, you know, I mentioned that a little bit that can show some different signs of some overgrowth and also show some other things in other areas. So sometimes there's, you know, some relevance for an organic acids test because it's going to look at neurotransmitter metabolism and energy production and some things outside of the gut, but could be relevant for bloating. And I'm sure there are others. Um, that, that could be important. But like I said, I'm just kind of skimming through these. Everybody's different. I don't have like a, a bloating protocol lab test that everybody that bloats gets this one lab test. So bloating solutions is, is the most important thing. And we're going to go into these in detail, but we really look at a, a three-pronged approach, a three-legged stool approach. Foods, you have to evaluate and eliminate your food triggers. That's really hard. Um, and it's very, very personalized. And we, I've had times where I've had bloating uh, couples come in that are both bloated, both miserable. We start them off in the same food plan and we'll find out that her triggers are way different than his triggers. So as we get a month, two months down the road, they're, they're finding totally different things. And that's tricky because then how do you, you know, how do you eat together? Um, but everybody's going to be different and unique. So that's very personalized, and that's something that never really stops. So you have to start by looking at your foods, of course. Then lifestyle, evaluating and supporting the underlying mechanisms. Are, are they too stressed? Are the, is their diet too poor? Are they eating on the run all the time? Are they, do they have neurodegeneration? Do they have vagus nerve weakness or lack of vagal tone? Do they have 
other lifestyle factors? Do they, do they have poor sleep? Do they have all these different things? Do they have a lot of toxic exposures? Looking at the lifestyle factors is, is of course, necessary. And, and the, the vagus nerve stuff, we'll get into that in a second, but that's really, really an important lifestyle thing that we get every bloating patient starting on vagus nerve stuff you know, right away. Um, and then supplements. So of course we use targeted supplements, but sometimes the goal is to break down the reactive foods, like in the ca case of uh, hydrochloric acid or digestive enzymes, breaking those foods down further. Sometimes the goal is to heal the gut lining and to heal the damage that has been done as we are you know, removing food triggers or something. Sometimes the goal is to kill off overgrowth, you know, to kill off SIBO. What I've found is that a lot of I get a lot of calls from people with SIBO that um, have done antibiotics and it like did great and then it came back because they don't look at these other things. You can't just kill off SIBO and then leave that assembly line broken and then expect it to stay gone. Like that doesn't make any sense at all. So you have to do all these things. If you just do something to kill off SIBO, it will not work. Or if you have a yeast overgrowth and you just do antifungals and you feel amazing, it will not work long term. It will come back if you're not taking some of these things into account. Sometimes the supplements might be to decrease immune reactivity in the case of autoimmunity. So all kinds of different things um, for the bloating solutions there. But let's talk about foods because that's probably the biggest thing um, that, you know, if you're watching this and you experience bloating and you've never heard of this, you can start looking at this right away and start evaluating some of your food triggers. So the biggest food triggers are for sure gluten, dairy, eggs, and FODMAPs, okay? And we're going to get into the details of what FODMAPs are. FODMAPs is probably the most common and, and most effective diet for bloating. So I'm going to explain what FODMAPs means, and then we'll get back to the gluten and dairy and eggs um, things there. So those can be uh, packaged, uh, maybe you'd say, in several diets. So several common diets that are out there. Like I said, low FODMAPs is probably the most common and probably the most uh, successful. Uh, the SCD diet, which is a specific carbohydrate diet, it's, it's similar. Um, and you can there's some lists that we give people that kind of combine SCD foods with FODMAP foods, and that's a really, really powerful combination, but really great stuff on SCD diet. Um, really great website called scdlifestyle.com, I think, from uh, um, Jordan and Steve, some guys that I've, I've worked with in, in some different aspects, um, a coaching program thing that they did. Um, but yeah, good stuff there. So an elemental diet, that's kind of a newer one in the SIBO world. It's a liquid-only diet. Um, you can get elemental shakes and smoothies that are kind of meal replacements, and it's just it's an interesting one that you can look up. It's it's not one that I um, use too often, but uh, I'm starting to look at it more and just look always want to know what options there are in case one of these doesn't work for people, right? Um, there's a SIBO biphasic diet, so that's by a doctor called uh, Dr. Jacoby. Um, I think she's out of like Australia or maybe South Africa, um, but a SIBO biphasic diet. We will often share that with patients, an ebook about it, just for them to look at and be familiar with. We don't follow the exact protocol, but it does have recipes and it does have options. And this is really, really tough for people. So we try to give them as many resources as we can, because as we're going to go through here in a minute, there is no book that everybody fits into or no plan that everybody fits into. An elimination diet, of course, makes sense. And an autoimmune paleo, in some instances, would absolutely make sense. But how do you know? We're going to cover that in a second after we talk about FODMAPs. So what are FODMAPs? FODMAPs is an acronym. They are fermentable. So we've talked about that fermentation. So these are fermentable fibers and sugars. Um, and so in a lot of sugar. So fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. Okay, so what does that mean to you? So fructose, these are some of the things that are in FODMAPs, okay? So what you can do with this is go and, and, and look up FODMAPs a little bit more, but I'm going to go through some of the major ones. So they're fermentable, and then they're oligo, di, and monosaccharides, so these different lengths of sugars, and polyols. So what, what do you want to look out for? What are some of the, the categories? 
Fructose is a big one. It's a fermentable sugar, and it's fruit sugar. So it's in your sugary fruits. No surprise there. And, and what we'll find is that as somebody's starting a FODMAP diet, like that husband and wife I mentioned, one person might be more sensitive to the O in FODMAPs. One person might be more sensitive to the P in FODMAPs. And we don't know until we get a little bit further down the road and one person says, boy, onions tear me up. And the other person says, boy, apples tear me up. Um, so we don't know except without, with, with trial and error and with some hard work with that. So fructose, apples, mangoes, pears, watermelon, juices, any juices for sure, high fructose corn syrup, of course. The juice is important because in the juice, they've separated the, the sugar from the fiber. So you're just getting the fructose, you're just getting a high dosage of, of, of fruit sugars, and that can be a common cause of bloating. So if you get bloating, you know, be aware of that. Lactose is a FODMAP, so that's in, in anything dairy. Um, so dairy is a really, really common bloating trigger. And so the solution there is just, you know, cut out dairy. Fructans, fructans are uh, different fibers that are in asparagus, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, onions, garlic, and wheat. Uh, so sometimes we'll find that the fructans category, uh, or fructans, some people call it, but fructans, fructans um, is, is really the, the big one. When somebody comes in in their paperwork and they say, boy, broccoli, cauliflower, um, asparagus really light me up, that's exactly what I'm thinking is, oh, this person's going on a low FODMAP diet. They're, they're eating all the healthy foods, right? The, the green leafy vegetables, the cruciferous vegetables, the broccoli, the cauliflowers, the asparagus, the Brussels sprouts, and, and they're getting all this bloating, so they need to eliminate them while we work on this underlying imbalance, and then they can reintroduce those, and then all of a sudden those foods become healthy again. You know, when I eat broccoli, asparagus, cauliflower, all those leafy greens and things, cruciferous vegetables, I have no complaints, no symptoms. That's where we want to get somebody to. It's not that they can never eat them again in their life. Galactans are more the legumes. Um, so the galactans, the baked beans, chickpeas, lentils, cashews, and other legumes. So eliminating some of those legumes that we all know that that beans are the beans, beans, the magical fruit. The more you eat, the more you toot. I mean, everybody knows that. Uh, so beans can make a lot of gas production. So looking for that, that category in the galactans. And then the polyols. So apples, you see apples again. So apples have high, high fructose. And they also have polyols, um, apricots, avocado, blackberry, cherry, peach, plum, pear again. Uh, plum would also be have some good amount of fructose in it. Cauliflower down there, greens, mushrooms. So looking for which one of these categories is a trigger. So starting off, you look at all FODMAPs, you eliminate all FODMAPs, and you just you follow a low FODMAP diet. You don't worry about the things you can't eat. You worry about the things that you can eat, and you just start from there, and then you kind of notice some of your trigger foods. So there is a lot of trial and error in this. A lot of food journaling that can be really important or just, you know, being very observant for how you're reacting. And so FODMAPs diet, and, and let's say there's also some of this we talked about can be autoimmune, which would be an elimination diet. And that's what I want to talk about next is, you know, which diet is right for you following a FODMAPs diet or following an elimination diet. And some of those things cross over because an elimination diet or an autoimmune paleo is going to cut out gluten, it's going to cut out dairy, it's going to cut out eggs. Eggs aren't a FODMAP, but eggs are a really, really common source of bloating. So which diet is right for you? I don't know. So we will try to point you in the right direction. But what we tell our patients is that we're taking things from both diets and we're forming the patty diet or the Jerry diet or the Lori diet or et cetera, insert your name here. And through this trial and error, we're not putting you on one diet or one meal plan or one book to follow. We're starting there and then we're customizing it to you. So which diet is right for you? So in a FODMAPS diet, you're looking more for fermentation 
triggers. What do you eat and it bloats you right away? So it is gluten and dairy free. Eggs are considered suspect on a, on a FODMAP diet. Eggs are also considered suspect on an autoimmune. So you see those top three lines. You're just looking for different things. So that's kind of the confusion between the two of like, which one should I do? They're very similar. But FODMAPs is cutting out the FODMAP foods. Autoimmune is cutting out autoimmune foods like gluten, dairy, eggs, corn, soy, um, things like that. So it cuts out, the FODMAPs do cut out many healthy fruits and veggies. And so that might be a difference. Um, whereas an autoimmune paleo or an elimination diet, it can cut out nightshades or lectins depending on how strict you want to be. But on a, on a traditional elimination diet, like let's say from the Institute for Functional Medicine, fruits and veggies get a green light all the way. So if you have bloating, that might not be good for you. Sure, you're cutting out gluten, you're cutting out dairy, you're cutting out eggs, and that you might hit the nail on the head. But if you're still eating, you're upping your broccoli, your cauliflower, your asparagus, your apples, your fruits, your veggies, that might be bad for you. So oftentimes, it's a combo of the two. And on a FODMAPS diet, because it is gluten, dairy-free, and, and we, you know, egg-free, it, that's probably a better place to start with bloating. But along the way, you want to try to figure this out, or we want to try to figure this out of like, in the middle of the two of these is your diet, is the Taylor diet, is the Jamie diet, is the Dave diet, or whoever. So FODMAPs diet is a lot of trial and error, a lot of looking at what you're reacting to and cutting those out and then maybe reintroducing them with the same concept as an elimination diet. It is, by definition, an elimination diet. You're eliminating foods and then you're adding them back in. But it's not for the intention of autoimmune reactivity. So for an autoimmune test, you could look at food sensitivity testing or there's a lot of trial and error, same thing. You eliminate the food for a period of time, maybe 30 days, then you reintroduce it. With autoimmune, you're gonna wanna wait uh, three to four days for your reintroduction to see if you have any other symptoms and it might not be bloating, it might be anxiety, it might be brain fog. Some people add eggs back in and all of a sudden they can't make a fist with their fingers and they can tell that eggs are a trigger because they're more inflamed. With FODMAPs, you're looking more for an immediate response or like pretty pretty immediate after you eat it. Um, that if you eat onions or like onion powder, garlic powder, sometimes people find garlic powder just, just tears them up and they can notice that right away. So you're looking at those things. So the diet's a huge part. Like we said, the three-pronged approach, diet, lifestyle and supplements. So lifestyle, let's go back to that and, and just look at some of the neurological solutions. We have another video on this, but this is incredibly, incredibly powerful for bloating is most often people with bloating aren't like, hey, I go to the bathroom once, maybe twice a day, like clockwork every single day, perfectly formed stool, etc. Most people have some, some digestive issues and so we want to strengthen their gut-brain connection through the vagus nerve. So we will, and we have other videos on this, I may have just said that. So go back and watch those about the importance of the vagus nerve, or how to do vagus nerve exercises. I think we have one called Six Ways to Stimulate the Vagus Nerve. Um, I forget the number. Um, but so gargling. That's the most powerful one that we found is getting our patients to gargle and gargle aggressively fires off that nerve pathway that you don't feel it, but it's the nerve that controls from the brain stem down to the gut that controls motility. So gargling can help strengthen that. And it's kind of like, you know, doing a, a curl with your arm is like, it doesn't happen overnight, but you continue to do that over and over and over and it strengthens that pathway, and it increases what's called vagal tone, just like doing curls increases muscle tone. Uh, gagging is another one, same thing, the back of the throat stimulates that area, stick something back there, stimulate your gag reflex, kind of dry heave, it's a weird one, but um, it's, it's effective and it stimulates that vagus. 
Um, we also use a TENS unit, um, which is an electrical stimulation unit. You hook it on an ear clip to your ear here. We've got several resources about that, a, a video about that, and a little um, instructional uh, ebook about how to do that and some different things because it's a really cool thing. The research on that is, is very, very new but you can use a TENS unit to stimulate the vagus nerve or a coffee enema. Uh, coffee enema is interesting because first off, I put it last on the list because it's the least likely that people are gonna try it. Like the first two are free and easy. The second one is pretty cheap. Uh, the third one is not the cost, it's more like the, uh, you know, people don't wanna do that. Um, but what a coffee enema does is it's not just flushing out your bowels, but the coffee and the caffeine, it stimulates nicotin, uh, nicotinic receptors in the um, colon, acetylcholine, cholinergic receptors, and, and that is really, really good for motility. So it's not about putting coffee up your colon and then you know, spraying it out. It's not what it's about at all. In fact, the number one mistake that you can make with a coffee enema is not make your coffee strong enough. Um, so you want strong coffee that's gonna challenge those receptors and it's more of a neurological thing and it's really, really powerful. So if you have bloating and you've tried everything else that we've talked about here, try a coffee enema by all means um, and, and it could be helpful to you. Supplement solutions for bloating. So once again, that three-pronged approach, diet, lifestyle. We didn't say anything with lifestyle about stress, you know, there's tons of resources about that on our page and others. You, if you have it, you got to decrease it. If you're eating on the run, you know, sometimes just deep breathing before your meals can help shift you into rest and digest rather than being in fight or flight. Um, so three-pronged approach. But he, And here's the supplement solution. So these are just, once again, throwing a bunch of stuff out there. Everybody's going to be different based on their symptoms. I'm going to have different recommendations based on their symptoms. So hydrochloric acid um, by itself, there's several at-home acid tests. If somebody had reflux or some other symptoms that pointed to that, we might put them on hydrochloric acid. We might try it anyway um, and just see how they respond. It's inexpensive and if they have a bad response, we can discontinue. And we've got some solutions to kind of work around that roadblock using apple cider vinegar and some other things. Um, digestive enzymes. So there's a broad variety of digestive enzymes. The one that I use the most often has 250 milligrams of hydrochloric acid in it, has what's called DPP-4 enzymes also, which help break down gluten and casein, um, which are in gluten and, and dairy proteins. Um, and so yeah, digestive enzymes can be really, really helpful. Uh, charcoal and clay are different binders. Uh, great symptomatic results from these. They can bind certain things and get rid of them. And, you know, just, you know, activated charcoal is probably one of the first things if you Google bloating supplements, which I haven't never done, um, that's probably one that's going to come up is doing something like an activated charcoal. Probiotics, for sure, of course, probiotics. Some are safer than others. Some strains are safer than others. Some fillers are safer than others. Some have like arabinogalactans in them and arabinogalactans can, can be problematic. Uh, some have prebiotics in them. Prebiotics can be problematic. Um, inulin, things like that can be problematic for SIBO, some of these fibers. So you want to be careful with probiotics. We use some uh, like so soil-based probiotics are good for this. Um, we use some um, yeast-based probiotics, and, and we have one called Sibiotica, which is a SIBO-safe or SIBO-specific probiotic, and you know just um, can be really good for this, but probiotics certainly help with, with bloating, but sometimes can make it worse. And do they have SIBO? If they have SIBO, then do we want to kill off the overgrowth? And if so, we're going to use something like biocidin or other herbal antimicrobials and antifungals to kill off that overgrowth. But you need to be careful because like we just said, fiber, prebiotics, probiotics, gums, all these things can make SIBO worse. 
So you just want to give people, a, I just want to give people a list and say, hey, be aware of these things. And if you find that one of them is triggering you, let me know so that we can work with that. And that tells us something. That's a piece of the puzzle. If you're noticing that you're having a reaction from, from something. Is it neurological? Well, then we might need something like glutathione or nitric oxide support or you know other things if it's, if it's neuro, of course. Is it autoimmune? We might need things like turmeric, resveratrol, glutathione, fish oil, short-chain fatty acids. Short-chain fatty acids should be up there higher too of, you know, that's a good one for bloating. But there's all kinds of options for supplement solutions and it's really, really tricky and really customized as far as what each individual patient and case needs. But these are some things that you can certainly try. I already said this. Oh, I think I tried to... Uh, Take that from the other slide into this slide. I already said this. Is it neurological? Is it autoimmune? Um, other bloating solutions, like I already kind of mentioned, stress management, deep breathing, coffee enemas. as I said. Fasting can be really, really powerful. Now, think about this for a second. With fasting, um, your digestive system, if it takes an average of 18 hours to break down a meal, your digestive system has never really had a full break probably ever since you've been alive. Um, it's never been like fully empty. And when it does, it allows the what's called migrating motor complex to really do a clean sweep through your digestive system. And that's really, really important. Another thing with the neurological component of this and the, the migrating motor complex, we will say that the digestive tract is like, if you've ever seen the wave, go around a, a baseball or probably more like a football stadium and it goes from section one to two to three to four and it's kind of cool to see when you know 10,000, 50,000 people are doing that. But it can't go section one, then section 10, then section two. It's got to go in right order and this migrating motor complex that the vagus controls has to go in the right order. And anyway, fasting can give your digestive system a little bit of a break and a little bit of a reset and it's really, really powerful. Another one is exercising. Just, you know, are you exercising enough? Are you hydrated? You know, just some really, really simple things that can't be overlooked because they're really, really important. So with all that being said, that is an absolute lot of information about bloating. And hopefully it gives you some resources. If you're still at the place where you're just, hey, I need to try some things for this, then this certainly gives you some resources and gives you some food for thought. But it also probably illustrates that it is helpful to work with a practitioner that can kind of put tie these things together and say, hey, this is happening and that's why 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 you're bloated. So we've got to work backwards and we've got to get upstream at some of these root causes and it's going to take some time. It's not like you're going to take a supplement and tonight your bloating is going to be gone. This didn't develop overnight. It's not going to heal overnight. Some of those things are really, really important concepts. But this is a pretty comprehensive overview of bloating of some of the most common mechanisms and of the three-pronged approach that we take looking at your foods, certainly, your lifestyle, and also what supplements can we take to speed things up. Also talked about lab testing that we use for that. Also talked a lot about SIBO because what an important concept for bloating. So hope that's helpful. Hope you enjoyed that. Let us know in the comments. Uh, give us some likes and subscribe or send it to a friend that you know has bloating.